There's a pretty powerful consensus that urgent action is needed to confront climate change. There is, however, equally widespread attachment to the standard of living we've got that relies on so much of what's causing climate change. In effect, we've never had it so good, even as it's killing the planet. That is the paradox at the heart of journalist Arno Kopetsky's new book. It's called The Environmentalist's Dilemma, Promise and Peril in an Age of Climate Crisis, and it brings Arno Kopetsky to our airwaves tonight from Vancouver, British Columbia. And it's great to have you on the program. Arno, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. Thanks, Steve. How are you? I'm just grand. All the better for having you on. And I guess, I mean, we've hinted at this first question in our introduction, but let's have you lay out the thesis anyway. Uh, the environmentalist dilemma. What is it? Sure. Well, as you said, uh, the dilemma actually began as a paradox. Uh, an argument I was having in my mind that felt like it was being reflected in society at large and in the public discourse about, you know, all the progress is really unambiguous progress that humanity has made over the last couple of centuries, uh, due largely to fossil fuel production, but not only that, um, because of our industrial model, you could take anything you want. My wife delivers babies for a living. And, you know, before the industrial revolution, one in a hundred women were dying in childbirth. Uh, now it's about one in 10,000 and the same thing for, you know, infant mortality, uh, medicine, dentistry, the electric light bulb, uh, and not just in the material realm, but human rights, public education. Uh, you know, I have a six-year-old daughter now, and she is coming into a world that has vastly more opportunity than almost any other point in, in human history. So there's this whole realm of, of, of wonderful things uh, about being alive in the world today uh, that, that I think are, we, we would be right to celebrate. But at the same time as this is happening, uh, the natural world is just collapsing all around us. And, and that is, you know, there's a direct correlation between the well-being of humanity and the destruction of, of the global ecosystem, basically. And I, I think when you look at some of the conversations and, and, you know, the polarization that's going on in the world today, in every province, in every country, in every of the world, I, I think a lot of people are sort of sticking to one side or the other of these, of this, sort of outlook on life. Either it's better than ever or it's worse than ever. Never, things have never been so good, but we're all going to die. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and so I wanted to sort of dive into that and lean into that because I, I myself was unresolved in, in how should we address this. I think the environmental community, which I identify with and, and admire and, and, and have, you know, follow in that tradition, uh, has a tendency perhaps to overlook some of the, the, the advances that humanity has, has made. Um, and the, you know, the, the oil patch, for example, tends to overlook some of the costs uh, that have come with their industry. So that was the impetus for this book. As I looked into it, I thought, well, you know, it's, it's not that much of a paradox, really. We're just living on borrowed time. This, we have, we've eaten through our ecological inheritance in terms of forests and fish and natural resources. Um, and now climate change is sort of the sharp tip of that spear that is that is that is coming down on 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 the whole world, and and that is the most immediate pressing problem. As you know, I live in British Columbia, and so we've had a dramatic illustration of, of how badly things can go when when climate warms just by one point one degrees. So the dilemma comes in now. What do we do about this thing? We even if everybody agreed, which of course we don't, that we are living in a time of immense ecological crisis. Uh, it would not be clear exactly how to proceed. Um, well, let me pick know, up on that. We... I'm going to, I, I'm, I'm, sure. I'm, now that you've laid the thesis out, let's dive into, uh, I'm going to read one excerpt from the book here, and then we'll, uh, we'll sort of pull, pull that apart if we can. Sheldon, why don't you bring the graphic yeah. up, and everybody at home can read along. For two centuries and more, fossil fuels have been at the center of human prosperity. Directly and indirectly, oil and gas and coal have enabled everything we love about civilization. Abundant food, easy travel, leisure time, warm homes, education, music, medicine, all of it. Civilization runs on energy. Fossil fuels have supplied more of it than ever before. The power structures that dominate our modern world have grown directly out of fossil fuels. Now, all that is changing. A lot of people don't want it to. To acknowledge climate change means we also acknowledge that practically everything about the way we live must also change. It means we have to give up our gas-guzzling cars, stop flying around the world for fun, eat a lot less meat. Perhaps even more painful than changing our behavior, acknowledging climate change means acknowledging our guilt. It means admitting all the damage we've inflicted. Okay, let's dive in there, Arno. Important to acknowledge our guilt. How come? 
Well, I think that's what makes, you know, at its heart, I, I see this as really a, a psychological drama in many ways. I, I think a lot of people, you know, look at look at any of the personal changes you've had to make in your life. Uh, often the hardest part is to admit, I messed up. I did something wrong. There were consequences to what I did, and I don't want to own that. Um, and I think that's a big part of what we have to do as as Canadians. You know, we're the fourth biggest oil and gas producing country on the world in the world. Uh, oil and gas production has caused immense damage, uh, both in, environmentally, but also uh, socially and, and politically. And I, I think the first step in changing our economic system, uh, as well as our political and, and social structures, uh, begins with sort of an ownership of what did we do wrong? Where did we go wrong? And, and until we acknowledge that, I think it's really hard for Canadians collectively to get behind the switch that needs to come. And, and you know, that begins one could say with, you know, switching, you know, down, downsizing the oil sands and switching over to all the renewable energies that are available to us from wind and solar and, and geothermal. Well, let's beyond that. Uh, you go, I mean, we, we just gave a, we just gave a pretty intense list of things that go beyond that. So <laughs> yes, I got to ask yes. you, once we've acknowledged our guilt, do you think we're prepared to give up meat, stop flying all over the world, do all of those things that you just suggested are necessary? I don't know if we're prepared for that or not. I think that's a conversation that I and many people are trying to to initiate. Uh, I don't want to dwell, you know, at other places in the book. Uh, I talk about that this is not just about guilt and shame and, and darkness. I think there's a lot to celebrate about the future ahead. I think we're living in an age of, of immense anxiety and depression and sort of, you know, fear of keeping up and 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 fear of these consequences that we all know are are coming down the pipe. And and so I, I think. There's an opportunity to shed a lot of that uh, anxiety and, and fear and, and move to a place of, hey, we could actually simplify our lives. We could spend a little more time with the people we love. We could live in a way that is more harmonious, both with this planet and with our, with our fellow humans who we, who we, who we share this, this beautiful country and this world with. Uh, you know, a big part of this book also talks about, if we're, if we're talking about guilt and, and the damage done, uh, who who has suffered the damage? It has been really primarily people of color. Uh, in this country, it's been in the indigenous peoples who live from coast to coast, who live tend to live much more on the land than than in urban areas where 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 we urban dwellers can be a bit more sheltered from the consequences of climate change and other disasters. Uh, in the United States and in Canada, of course, but it's 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 African Americans who have who live in direct proximity uh, to to some of these huge industrial projects, you know, the uh, Cancer Alley in the United States. Um, everywhere you look, and this and this is around the world, you know, I spent a lot of time traveling through South America where Canada has a lot of mining and oil interests doing immense damage on indigenous territory. And so these are the, the populations who are suffering the, the real initial brunt of, of our industrial onslaught on, on the planet. And, and there's a reparations uh, to be had there and I think that's what some of what we've seen in the last in the last couple of years here in North America with truth and reconciliation, with Black Lives Matter. You know, those things are all intertwined. Uh, that you might think, oh well, that what is what does Black Lives Matter have to do with climate change? These things are connected. This is all about sort of a colonial, uh, extractive model of oppression of of people and and you know the old thing goes first they came for so and so then they came for so and so and and finally they came for us and so i guess when i talk about guilt and and acknowledging that guilt there is a sort of a pragmatic element to it that that says you know it's not if, if it's not just going to happen to to them, uh, it is going to it is going to come for us, and and I think it is beginning to. Well, I've got to ask the overarching question then, which is, do you think fundamentally capitalism, which kind of requires constant economic growth, is fundamentally at odds with saving the planet? Yeah, you know, it depends on your definition of capitalism, I suppose. I take real issue. I have a chapter about growth and infinite growth being completely uh, out of touch with the ecological realities of living on a circular finite earth. Uh, but to me, capitalism is about private ownership of the means of production. Um, and I don't think that is necessarily incompatible with with sustainability. I think capitalism has become untethered from any kind of regulation almost, you know, 
there's a problem of inequality that is, you know, we're living back in the Gilded Age. Uh, inequality has, has reached levels uh, commensurate to France right before the, the, the revolution. Uh, so that's an issue. But there's, you know, communism under, under Stalin was one of the worst things for the environment you could imagine. I, I, I don't think, I think whatever economic model humanity adopts or ends up choosing, uh, we're going to have to reckon with ecological realities. And so I I actually don't think, you know, others would certainly disagree with me, uh, but I don't really take issue with capitalism per se. I think it needs to be intensely regulated uh, and dramatically reformed, but I don't have an issue with, you know, private capital and, and, and trade and people uh, making a decent living. Uh, But for example, if you look at tax rates around, around the great depression and then through to the 1960s in the United States, the top marginal income rate was 90%. And then after around the 70s, it started dropping. And then by the time the, the, uh, by the, time, uh, the Russian empire collapsed and, and communism fell, uh, the United, that top marginal in- income tax rate had dropped to about 28%. Uh, so they just stopped taxing the rich. So I think taxing the rich is compatible with capitalism and, and we can do that, for example. Well, let's. You, in the midst of that answer, we, you talked about indigeneity, and I want to follow up on that because uh, there may sure. be an impression that our viewers and listeners have that the typical environmentalist is um, probably white male, forty something, walks around in Birkenstocks, uh, gives uh, money. There you go. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> gives well, money to Greenpeace or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, you yeah. tell us in the book that. The indigenous people who've lived on this land for more than 10,000 years have been pretty strong environmentalists. You want to make that case? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I want to start by resisting the the, the 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 sort of romantic notion that that First Nations have some sort of supernatural connection uh, to the Creator. Um, I, I, that's not at all what I'm trying to say. But I do think First Nations and indigenous communities tend to live. Uh, in direct contact with ecosystems that we are sheltered from, uh, uh, those of us who live in cities, uh, as I do. Um, and so, for example, forest fires in this country uh, have, you know, the number of, of, of refugees from forest fires has quintupled in the last 40 years. And the majority of those people who are getting kicked out of their homes because of fire are, are Indigenous uh, citizens of, of communities because they lived in direct interface with forests. Um, if you're talking about, you know, what, what is the relationship? Let's go back a second and talk about me being the, the white poster child for uh, environmentalism. Um, you know, it, I have a chapter about this in my book, and I look at Canada's national parks uh, were really a colonial crime scene when they were created. I grew up in Edmonton, and we used to go to Banff and Jasper National Park for holidays as a kid. Uh, only in my 30s did I realize what it led to the creation of those parks that. The, the original citizens of those parks, the First Nations who lived there, were evicted, shunted into tiny reserves, and you know, basically a big fence was put around those parks and said, okay, First Nations, you are not allowed to go back there ever. Everyone else, you can go there and look, but don't touch. And that is part of a model that you know, began in the United States, and really and by the, the first environmental impulse in, in North America began as, as a very sort of white, vision of nature as this thing that you look at but don't touch and brown people should not go there and let's get rid of those pesky indigenous inhabitants um and now that's finally starting to become rectified you know and and it took a long time for the environmental community to get there so do you think there is Uh, good allyship now between first nations and the so-called environmental movement i do it's not for me to say whether we are good allies but I, i do think that the environmental movement has learned a lot about not just tokenizing indigenous communities and, and sort of using them uh, to gain, you know, public buy-in. I, I think now genuinely when you look at a lot of environmental movements, especially here in BC, uh, they are led by First Nations communities who live in the territories that are affected by pipelines or, you know, mining operations or hydroelectric dams. Well, it's can I push Nations- back a bit on that, Arno? Because, I, I, yeah. you know, is it also not important to acknowledge that there are certainly several and significant First Nations leaders in this country who are pro-mining and pro-pipeline and are happy to go into business uh, with uh, established Canadians in order to make that happen. I love these kinds of stories and it's very true, you're right. Mm. 
Um, there are several right here in British Columbia, where I live. There's there's a, there's been an issue about logging old growth uh, on the coast here. Uh, what little we have left is being logged, and one of the First Nations on whose territory it sits, uh, they are they have asked the the blockaders, the environmentalists who are blockading the logging roads. They have asked them to leave so that they could keep logging. They have their own sawmill that is specifically designed to log old growth cedar. Um, so absolutely, I think the environmental movement has a tendency to sort of overlook those pesky issues, uh, those pesky details, because they, you know, they complicate the narrative. And let's just ignore that and, and focus on the trees, uh, which is a mistake, I, I would say. Uh, my response is, what would happen if these First Nations actually had a choice? Uh, other than, you know, right now, their dilemma is, well, we could continue to live in perpetual poverty that has been imposed on us for the last two centuries by the colonial motto, or we could allow some of this industrial activity to proceed and at least make a little bit of money because at least now, you know, industry has learned, well, you can't do any of these projects. You can't build a pipeline. You can't log old growth. You can't build a hydroelectric dam without kicking some of the proceeds down to the First Nations whose territory it's on. Hmm. So, of course, those First Nations are going to tend to say, yeah, if that's my choice, poverty or at least a, some food on the table and an opportunity to make something of my life the way the rest of this country has done, it's pretty clear what they're going to do. Now, so I would say let's give them a, an honest choice that, or a better choice that involves maybe you know, options of, of sustainable living and, and a decent livelihood and, and even some reparations for the last two centuries of, of what's been done. And then let's see what they say. And then if they still want to proceed... Yeah, that's their right. And I think the environmental community should absolutely say, listen, uh, okay, if that's what you want to do, we disagree, but it's it's your territory, it's your land, you can do whatever you want. Mm. In our Boy, the time has really flown by here, but in our, in our remaining moments here, I do want to ask you, and you touch on this in the last chapter of your book, you know, so many people have spent the last 35 years, as our environmental awareness has increased, uh, recycling their garbage and composting, and maybe now they're buying an electric vehicle. And, you know, they're doing the things that they've been told to do, many people, in order to try to resolve this climate crisis. And you tell us most of that won't amount to a hill of beans, that it actually will take significant, consistent government action and regulation over the next couple of decades in order to get to where we want to get to. Is climate change an unresolvable problem? No. It is not. Uh, you're absolutely right. That it is a collective action problem, and only collective action can change that. And that has that means you know industrial, you know top government and corporate action. Um, I have a chapter about that. You know another dilemma is well, what difference does it make for me to do anything or not not do anything? I think each of us wrestles with this sort of individual versus collective action conundrum. Um, the point that I make and that I believe is uh, that individual action does actually matter. A, I think it's a way of giving each of us individuals agency and therefore purpose in an age when people are lacking both those things and sinking into despair and apathy. Um, but more importantly, and it, you know, it can sound trite to say, but each of these individual act actions does add up to millions and millions of actions. And I think, you know, one of the examples I use is, is elections. Every time we have an election in, in this country, um, millions and millions of people decide, well, I'm going to vote. Even though we know it really makes no difference, my puny one little vote is not going to change a, a thing. But taken all together, they really add up. And, and to me, that's a beautiful metaphor for uh, the way that collective change can come. Uh, especially when it's tied into activism and these huge marches and demonstrations that we're seeing, you know, that today's generation of youth are are far more organized than 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 mine than than we were when I was, you know, 20 years old. Organized and, in one respect, or, organized in terms of issues, but not at all politically organized. They're almost completely disengaged from voting and from backing political parties. So where does that get in us? Canada? In, in Canada, they are. In, in the United States, not at all. The Sunrise Movement in, this, in the United States is super strategic, very organized. They have they put uh, many of the most powerful senators and congresswomen, you know, AOC, um, uh, and a few of her, uh, the, you know, the squad that the squad. we hear about it in the United States. Mm -hmm. they, they 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 were really endorsed and, and helped a lot by by the Sunrise Movement, which also created the the green um, uh, the the Green New Deal. Uh, you know that that's a result of activism and and. A, I, I would love to see Canada 
uh, develop that kind of activism and and for th for that to emerge, uh, you know, I have another chapter about that and and, and sort of my my mixed feelings about activism and and the, the sort of the purity and of of purpose, but the sort of disdain for compromise and 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 political process. So uh, these questions are real. But to answer your question, I, I don't think climate change is is insurmountable. I, I think we are surmounting it. We have already bent the curve from initially, you know, just 10 years ago, humanity was on a trajectory for about five degrees of warming, uh, which would have basically, wiped, I, I can't even imagine what that would look like. It would have been so catastrophic. Now we're down to about 2.4, 2.7, still catastrophic. But if you look at the trajectory and the way that the curve is bending, it's happening. So we just have to keep pushing and believing. And yes, every little thing you do matters. That does not mean that, um, that, Recycling is going to save the day. It's not, but it does mean that you can play a part in this story. And I think at the end of the day, my message is not that you have to become an activist or a rebel, but that you can engage with what I think is the story of our time. We are happy to remind people that your book is called The Environmentalist Dilemma, Promise and Peril in an Age of Climate Crisis. And we're delighted that it's brought Arno Kopetsky to our airwaves tonight from Vancouver, British Columbia. Arno, thanks. I got to tell you, you pack a lot of punch in a book that's uh, not much more than 200 pages. So well done, and thanks for coming on to TVO tonight. Thanks, Steve. So great to chat with you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.